On today's show, we start off our coverage for the 2023 World Junior Championship with projected lineups for Team Canada and Team USA. That's all coming up on Locked On NHL Prospects. You are Locked On NHL Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome back to Locked On NHL Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. On this podcast, I break down everything prospects related for you five days a week, Monday to Friday. I'm Hattie Kalakesh. I'm a scout and prospect analyst across multiple platforms, including this one. I've got a very good show for you today. The World Junior Championships are right around the corner, so I want to take a moment and look at the lineups, look at the rosters, who's been cut, who's made the cut. Um, and what they, they're going to look like once the puck drops uh, for the World Juniors in Halifax and Moncton. So before we get into any of it, just remember to like and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. And remember to make us your first listen of the day if you're listening on your favorite podcasting platform. It is always very much appreciated. So let's get right into it with Team Canada. For me, Team Canada is the front runner for this tournament. There are a lot of very good lineups, um, but Canada, with the offensive weaponry that they have, it's, it's going to be very difficult to dislodge them. Even then, usually, if they come a- away from the World Juniors without a medal, it's considered disappointment most years. So they're they're mainly you know among the favorites for this tournament. So I want to start with the cuts because you know some of these cuts would probably be top nine forwards or top four defensemen on most, if not every uh, other nation. So we start off with Owen Beck of the Montreal Canadiens. Uh, we've also got Zachary Balzuc of the St. Louis Blues, Jordan Zumet of the Columbus Blue Jackets. Those three guys should almost absolutely have been sort of part of this roster. But um, you know we're not going to spend too much time on the cuts because Team Canada usually makes some shaky decisions um, with the players that they cut for this tournament. We've got Ryan Green, who's been playing really good hockey uh, for Boston University in the SCAA. He's a Chicago Blackhawks prospect. We've also got Riley Kidney of the Habs again. Um, he's one of the leaders in the queue in terms of scoring, but that one was pretty expected. Then we go to defense. We've got Carson Lambos of the Minnesota Wild. That was a really the, the most shocking one out of all these. Lambos, to me, was almost definitely a top four defenseman in this roster, and they opted for guys that I probably wouldn't even consider um, you know, top 10 defenders for, for Canada. But again... You, every year they, they make some strange decisions with their cuts. They probably know more than I do about this, but I don't know. Lambos just seemed like a no-brainer. There's two other defensemen they cut in um, Evan Nausa of the Florida Panthers and Ethan Sampson of the Philadelphia Flyers. Now, these two guys didn't really impress me all that much in, in their play this season, so I'm, I'm not really surprised to see them cut. Um, the main one that really shocked me was Lambos. Uh, there, there's always one defenseman they leave out. You know, in the last few years, it was Brent Clark. This year, it's Lambos. It just happens that way. Then at goal, they they uh, cut two netminders um, ahead of this roster in Tyler Brennan of the New Jersey Devils. That was the shocking one. And William Rousseau of the 2023 NHL draft. He's an overager that's eligible this year. Um, he was sort of a no-brainer for me. I didn't see much you know, that was impressive from him. He's been playing well for the Quebec Rapport and the QMJHL, but that's about it. But Brennan, for me... He just seemed like, you know, he would at least get the backup role to, to Ben Goudreau, but they opted for someone different. Um, so now let's get into the core of players that did make the cut. Now, obviously, Shane Wright, Dylan Gunther, Brennan Offman, um, Connor Bedard, Adam Fantilli uh, were all sort of names that you were definitely going to see. Joshua Roy as well, you can consider in there. Logan Stankoven. Um, some of the names that, that made the cut, you know, were, were names that are decent but not overly impressive guys like Caden Bankier, Colton Dog, those are two guys that I would definitely take Owen Beck over. Um almost definitely Zachary Balduc as well. Those were two guys that I would almost definitely take ahead of those two. Um you've got Zach Dean who made the cut who was a pretty decent selection. I think he was he was one of those definites that was going to make it. Uh Reed Schaefer was one of the only guys from the 2022 draft along with, you know, Wright and a couple other guys who who made the cut. Um, but really it was, you know, Nathan Gauthier as well was, was one that made the cut of the Anaheim Ducks. So there's a lot of NHL prospects in here. There's a lot of almost definite NHLers. I think this crop at forward is really interesting, but Bankier and Doc, I just wasn't really convinced were better than Owen Beck. Um, especially with what Owen Beck brings to the ice. I mean, he's a tremendous two-way forward. He's probably one of the best two-way forwards in the CHL right now. Um, decent shot, uh, very good shot. In fact, a really good playmaking um, he can kill penalties, win face-offs. He just he can do a bit of everything, and it was pretty surprising for me to see Banker and Doc go ahead of him. 
Then at defense, we've got Brant Clark of the Los Angeles Kings, Nolan Allen of the Chicago Blackhawks, Ethan Del Mastro of the Chicago Blackhawks as well, Tyson Hines, surprisingly, of the Anaheim Ducks. Um, we've got Kevin Korchinski, which was almost a definite, uh, another Chicago Blackhawks defender. So the Hawks have three defenders um, in the in the top six for the um, for, for Team Canada. That's pretty impressive. We also have Jack Mateer of the National Predators. And finally, the most important one, for, in my opinion, the best one, Olin Zelliger of the Anaheim Ducks. Then in net, we have got Thomas Millich of the 2023 NHL draft. He's also an overager who went undrafted. Um, and Benjamin Goudreau, who's probably going to be the starter. He's a San Jose Sharks uh, prospect. He's been playing pretty well and almost definitely gets the goal to at least to start the tournament. Unless he falls off the map and performs poorly, he's going to be the guy. Um, so this core is really impressive. I think that, you know, in net is pretty slim for uh, Team Canada. I think that actually feeds into the decisions they made in terms of the defenders that they uh, retained for this draft. So guys like Jack Mateer, like uh, Nolan Allen, Ethan Del Mastro, you know, they're decent defense. They're, they're really good defensively, but I, I don't see much from them offensively. And I think they leaned in a side that they were going to go for more experience, more physical, and more defensively sound uh, blue liners then go for the the players who have that offensive upside like Carson Lambos or Evan Nelsa. Um I, I think that was sort of the direction they take. And I think that's because of th I, what I think is a lack of confidence in the goaltenders that they have at this tournament. Now, I think Tyler Brennan would probably be the type of guy to sort of compensate for that lack of high-end goaltending. But again, they went in a different direction with Milic and Godreau. I, I'm guessing they saw, you know, better hockey from them in their their preliminary games against uh, the U Sports All-Stars. So it, it's just, it, it's an interesting decision. I think for me, you always go with the best players available, the players that are going to give you as much pace and offensive skill as possible, because I think in this tournament, what wins you tournaments is goals. Um, you know, defense can only take you so far in a tournament with a lot of young guys who are going to make mistakes regardless. You can try to mitigate those mistakes as much as possible, or you can have the firepower to capitalize on opposing mistakes as much as possible, especially when they're going to be coming up against some rosters that, you know, are, are kind of thin on defense, who, who don't have, you know, the, the goalies required. I think a lot of teams are going to go the opposite direction and go for skill as much as possible. So I think Team Canada would have better benefited from having more uh, in that sense, but also the the forward core that they retain does have some defensive elements. Bankier and Doc are, are pretty decent defenders. I think they, they do a good job in their own zone. Um, but really what's going to win them this tournament, if it, if it does, it's going to be the, the, the Connor Bedard sort of conversation. Uh, Bedard, Wright, Fantilli, all those guys are going to be putting up, you know, solid performances for them. And I think those are the guys that they're going to build the team around and try to win championships with. Now, we're going to go into the projected lineup for Team Canada right after these messages. Do you like betting? BetOnline.net is your number one source for any wager that interests you. From the NFL to the NBA to the MLB and even NCAA football, UFC, golf, anything you like, they have you covered. You can find all the latest player developments, team matchups, news, podcasts, and in-depth analysis on every game on their website or app. They're, of course, a great source for all of your sports wagering information with live betting. So you can keep up with the bets as they unfold. Uh, they've got up to the minute scores for every sport out there. They're the fastest and easiest way to check in on all of your favorite games and events. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet online where the game starts. All right. So moving on to the projected lineups. Now, this is a difficult conversation every year. Um, because a lot of these players are pretty tight in terms of their skill set and, and where they should play. Um, but I think it plays out in a specific way that's going to bring up the best in each line. I've, I've put this together in a way that I think, you know, each line can contribute in a way. Um, and each line is pretty balanced in terms of what they bring. It's pretty complementary in terms of skill sets. Um, so let's get right into it. I'm going to start with the first line uh, at forward for uh, Team Canada. That, for me, is Dylan Gunther of the Arizona Coyotes, Connor Bedard of the 2023 draft, and Shane Wright of the Seattle Kraken. Now, Bedard, Gunther, and Wright as a line just works really well together. What I like about Gunther is the goal-scoring ability. Um, and, you know, obviously that's, you know, his skill set and goal-scoring are good enough in order for him to be in the top six. But what puts him on that first line with Bedard and Wright is the complementary skill sets. So Bedard is a guy who's going to be driving play in transition, who's going to be challenging, you know, netminders from pretty much everywhere, and is going to be creating a lot of offense for that team um, by, by just, you know, his skill set, the way that he skates, the way that he stick handles, and especially his elite shot. 
um, is going to create a threat down the middle, like a line straight down the middle that always needs to be considered with Bedard on the ice. You add to that Shane Wright, who's extremely an ad analytical, who's extremely um, calculated and poised with this play, um, who also has a good shot, but is also a very, very good playmaker. You combine that, um, with Bedard, you've already got a good sort of combination of skills. One guy who's going to drive play north-south consistently and, and create havoc on the ice with a skill. Um, and one guy who's going to be able to analyze the ice, understand positioning of defenders on the opposite team, and understand where his teammates are at all times, and benefit from the chaos that Bedard wreaks in the offensive zone in order to move off the puck, make plays, but also be ready for a one-touch pass once he gets the puck. Then you got Dylan Gunther, who... As soon as you feed him a puck pretty much anywhere, he's, he has the ability to capitalize and shoot it in the back of the net. So I think that trio would work extremely well off each other. Um, you know, Bedard creating the, the the chaos on the ice, right, benefiting from it with his vision, and Gunther moving off the puck and creating shots uh, wherever he can. So that's my first line. Then we go to the second line. We've got Logan Stankoven, Adam Fantilli, and Brennan Othman. Now, you've got a guy in Logan Stankoven who's going to be extremely disruptive. He's going to be going in corners, you know, battling it out, uh, creating loose pucks. And you've got Adam Fantilli who's going to support him in that. You've got one small guy in Stankoven, one big guy in Fantilli, and both of them are going to be able to contribute on the forecheck, you know, more or less equally. Fantilli's got a bit more of skill and inside play to his game. I think Stankoven is extremely relentless and has a high-end skill to be able to capitalize on those loose pucks um, and, and sort of react quickly to changes of direction, take loose pucks, take them the other way, and create rush chances. Fantilli's got the shot to capitalize. He's got the vision and playmaking in order to, to, to connect with Stankoven. And you just add that combo of chaotic, relentless four-checkers to Brennan Othman, who's one of the best goal scorers in this tournament, Who's, who's, you know, tried, tested, and proven at this level, and who has the ability, the uncanny ability to find space off the puck. You combine that with Fantilli and Stankov, and you've got a very, very good forechecking line with a lot of goal-scoring potential. I think those three are going to be working tremendously off each other to create offense. Then the third line, you can't sleep on this line. For me, it's Joshua Roy, Zach Dean, and Zach Ostapchuk. Those three, I mean, Roy is the type of guy that you feed him the puck and you just let him snipe it. You just, you funnel pucks to him in the offensive zone, um, and, and get goal scoring that way. But the downside with him, the Achilles, the Achilles heel with Joshua Hawaii, is he's going to give you pretty much nothing in transition. Um, he doesn't have a good skating stride and doesn't feel comfortable carrying the puck up the ice. Zach Dean absolutely is, though. He's the type of guy who's going to create a lot of transition offense. Zach Osipchuk as well. I think Osipchuk has got more of a forechecking identity. Um, and that'll feel, feed well off of why you send those two wingers into the boards. They're usually going to come out with the puck. Then you've got Dean, who's, you know, very sneaky, very shifty, um, and very quick and good in transition. I, I think that Dean's going to be, you know, carrying the puck up the ice, uh, probably going for a soft dump and letting Roy and, and Ostapchuk battle it out. And then once they're set in the offensive zone, they're cycling to their defensemen. Then you've got Roy moving off the puck, which is really, which he's really good to, at doing. You got Zach Ostapchuk, you know, driving the net, manning the the net front, and you got Zach Dean supporting, which he does really well. So I think those guys are going to be working really well off their defenders to create some, um, so, a sort of checking line, with, but with a lot of offensive potential. So yeah, don't sleep on this line; it could be very productive. Then the fourth line is a bit of a mixed bag. Um, I've got Reed Schaefer, Nathan Gaucher, and uh, Colton Dock working off each other. So Schaefer is that big guy who's going to drive the net and score. He, he's got that power forward element, and he's also pretty good defensively. Yet on top of that, Nathan Gaucher, who's another power forward, I think both two are going to be doing a lot of damage to bottom of the lineup uh, sort of effectives on other teams. Uh, your your third pair defenders, your 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 bottom six forwards, they're going to outwork them, outmuscle them, go to the net, and create offense. And you got Colton Dock, who's a bit of a um, he's a bit of a Swiss Army knife. He can do a bit of everything and uh, does it pretty well. Um, so he's going to be complementing those two and, and allowing them the space and the time in order to uh, drive the net, make plays, and, and just play offensively at a high level. Now, I've got Caden Banker as the outlier as a 13th forward, but I think he's going to be switching in and out with Colton Dock. If they're looking for more offense, they might go Dock. If they're looking for more defensive ability uh, and goal scoring, they might go for Banker. I just think that Schaefer and Gaucher already have that goal scoring ability, so having three goal scorers on the line, all three of which Andre comfortable distributing the puck might be an issue, but I think that Colton Dock is a very good distributor and, and would probably benefit from you know being on that bottom six and, and would help Team Canada a bit more than Bank here. Now, 
let's go to the defense. Uh, this one's going to be pretty interesting. I think this first pair is the best first pair in this entire uh, tournament. And it's Olin, Olin Zellweger and Brand Clark. Olin Zellweger is one of my favorites. Um, he's got a lot of offensive skill. He's able to, to find lanes and open them up really well from the blue line. He's constantly moving, constantly activating, constantly doing something offensively so he's going to bring a lot of that sort of offensive element to the game you pair him with brad clark who's a very good rush defender who's good defensively and on top of that does have some offensive skill those two are going to be activating it a lot and switching a lot with the bedards and rights who are comfortable cycling up um towards a point and covering for the defense so the two guys that, that are very comfortable doing that it, it feeds a lot of their offense as well because they're able to funnel down create chances so I think that front five, Gunther, Bedard, Wright, with Zellweger and Clark would be absolutely lethal in the offensive zone and in transition. Then the second pair for me is Kevin Korczynski and Ethan Delmastro. Now, Delmastro will be playing on his offside. Uh, it might be Korczynski said because I, I think both have played on their offside quite a bit in junior. Um, but I'm just more comfortable putting Korczynski on his, on his comfortable side uh, because he has less experience, because, you know, he does make some weird decisions even from his comfortable side sometimes. I think Del Mastro, who's more experienced, more defensively responsible, should be taking that right side. Um, but for, for me, the way they play off each other is pretty is going to be pretty interesting. I think Korczynski is a lot more offensively leaning than Del Mastro, even though Del Mastro is comfortable carrying the puck up the ice and closing down on the slot from the point. Um, I just see Korczynski as more of the offensive element on that duo, and Del Mastro, you know, has the defensive ability to compensate for that. And then the third pair is just entirely defensive, Nolan Allen and Jack Mateer. Um, So that's your shutdown defenders. Those are the th two guys you send out on the penalty kill, the two guys you send out to completely neutralize bottom sixes, uh, prevent them from doing anything tangible. Um, they're going to give you pretty much nothing offensively, but they're going to be there to prevent anything from happening defensively. So I think that pair would work really well together. And I've got Tyson Hines as the outlier. This is the guy that I'm like, why would you take him instead of Carson Lambos? Just based on upside, based on what they can do, I think Lambos is even a better defensive player than Tyson Hines, on top of being much better offensively. Hines has been benefiting a bit from, from being on the Sherbrooke Phoenix, a very offensively lean team uh, with the firepower of you know Joshua Roy, uh, Justin Gill, and uh, Ethan Gauthier, who's uh, 2023 eligible. I mean... I just, I yes, he's about a point per game right now in the queue, but it's it's not warranted based on his play, and especially defensively, he's he's a mixed bag. I mean, sometimes he's going to give you some good stuff, but a lot of the time you'll see a lot of weird decisions. So he's the outlier for me so far. I don't know really what he brings that's that's good enough to be a top seven defender in Canada uh, in terms of U twenty defenders. But you know, again, it's Team Canada; you can't really read too much into it. Then at goal, I think that Benjamin Goudreau has the, the starting role locked and loaded. It's all his, and it's going to be interesting to see what he does with that confidence from the coaching staff. Because Thomas Milic, I, I don't really see much out of him. Um, admittedly, I haven't seen him play much. At Quebec Rampal don't have much in terms of prospects that are worth watching, uh, and he's an overager. But, you know, we'll see with him if Goudreau ends up being a terrible goaltender in this tournament he might get a look or two and you never know with goalies sometimes you run away with tournaments that they shouldn't so it'll be interesting to see but for me Gojo has the definite upper hand on uh, Millich so far so that's really projected lineups for Team Canada now we're going to go into Team USA and do a full breakdown of them right after these messages all right so for our final segment I want to talk about Team USA's roster and projected lineups now their roster isn't cut yet there's still 10 names to cut We've got 32 players in selection camp. They can go up to 25, and most teams prefer having 22 to 24. So I'm going to assume they're going for 22. It's going to make things easier for me, if I'm perfectly honest. So in goal, they've got four guys uh, still yet in their uh, selection camp. So we've got Caden Umberico, who was there last season. Uh, Tyler Muslik, who uh, will probably end up uh, being the second string netminder to Emberico. They got Trey Augustine, who I think could be a sleeper. Um, he's been extremely good for the NTDP and could end up, you know, getting a mention. Might even be their third string netminder in case something happens. And Andrew Oak, who I, I think is almost definitely, if they're going for three netminder, they're going to go for Oak. Um, he was there last year and uh, was there as a support cast as well. So he's kind of their... They're, you know, if anything happens, we can throw them in type of guy. They'll go to defense. Uh, they've got a very, very good and talented young decor. The fact that Scott Morrow isn't even on this list is surprising, definitely. Um, but it just speaks to the amount of talent they have. So they've got Sean Behrens, Shai Booyam, 
Seamus Casey, Ryan Chesley, Aiden Hurstchuk, Luke Hughes, Lane Hudson, and Luke Middlestat. So there are 10 defensemen uh, in this selection camp, that, and they're going to have to cut. I think they can go down, go down to eight without sort of sacrificing much. Um, but the two guys I think are almost definitely going to be cut are Shai Buyam and Adam Hirschchuk. And if they're going for seven defensemen, they're going to cut one of either Ryan Chesley or Luke Matt Middlestat, in my opinion. So the projected pairings for Team USA, in my opinion, are going to be Luke Hughes and Ryan Ufko as the first pair. Uh, those two, you know, they have complementary skill sets. I think they both have offensive potential. Um, but I think Ufko is going to be the type of guy to sit back and let Hughes do most of the rovering. Because um, that's one thing Hughes does really well is activate offensively and create uh, off his stick. He's going to be driving deep in the offensive zone and creating plays um, from below the dots and stuff like that. So th that that pairing is going to be very interesting to watch. Uh, they can even activate uh, together offensively if the the four you know formation allows it. Then it's the second pair for me would be Sean Barons and Seamus Casey. Um, Sean Barons is really good offensively. He's got great rush defending as well. He's very physical for his size. He throws his weight around extremely well. Um, you know, he's going to offer a lot defensively, and I think Seamus Casey is going to be the one to sort of drive up the ice and create offense. He's been really good this year for the University of Michigan. Um, so I think they would work really well as a pair, even though they're both sort of undersized. I think that Barons' physicality will more than compensate for the lack of size on that pairing. And then the third pair for me would be Lane Hudson and Jack Pert. Now, this is not because I think Lane Hudson is less of a player than Sean Barons. I just think that the mindset of Team USA is going to be to play Barons with Casey because Barons complements Casey a lot more, whereas Hudson and Casey would be very tough defensively. Um, they would struggle a lot, especially against bigger, stronger uh, wingers uh, You know, in the middle six. It would kind of be difficult for them to contribute in a, in a decent enough way defensively that that pair stays together. So I think Lane Hudson gets bumped down to the third pair with Jack Pert, who's big, who's strong, pretty physical, very good defensively, and offers a bit of offensive upside to complement Hudson's, you know, you know, run and gun type of uh, type of game. So I think those two would work well together. And I think Jack Pert will be rotating out of that bottom pair with uh, either one of Ryan Chesley or Luke Middlestad. Now, Pert is a left-handed defenseman, so I think if they're going between Chesley and Middlestad, I think they're going to lean Chesley, even though he's younger, because Chesley's a right-handed defenseman, and he's very responsible defensively. So him and Hudson would be very good together, and I think that he might get some looks with Hudson on that third pair. Then we go to the forward core. Uh, right now, they've got 18 forwards, so they're probably going to cut that down to 13, so there's five cuts that they're going to have to make. Um, now, for me, what it seems like so far uh, is that the cuts are probably going to be Gavin Brindley, uh, 2023 NHL draft eligible. I want to reiterate, I love this prospect. I think he's really good. He might have top 15 potential in this upcoming draft, top 20 potential, but he's very undersized. And knowing Team USA, they like their forwards big. They like their forwards physical. Um, Gavin Brindley is going to consistently push the pace and create offensively, but I don't think that he's the guy that's going to um, impress Team USA enough out of this 2023 crop in order to stay there. So far, there are four 2023 draft eligibles in this 18-man um, roster. It's Brindley, Ryan Leonard, Will Smith, and Charlie Stramel. I think those last three are going to be the ones to stay. So Brindley would be the cut for me with Kenny Connors. Uh, Jack Devine, who is a Florida pick from the seventh round of last year, he hasn't shown me much that's impressive. Um, same thing for Noah Leba. He's a New York Rangers prospect who, you know, doesn't offer much, you know, doesn't offer enough offensively for me to, to make the cut. And Sam Lipkin, who's a seventh rounder of the Arizona Coyotes. So those are the, those are the five guys that I think that Team USA are going to be cutting. Um, now for the projected lineups for Team USA, I think that Charlie Stramel is going to be the outlier as a 13th forward. I think that the, the amount of skill in that top 12 that I have right now, it, it just bumps him out, but it's very tight. Um, I think he could slot in the lineup on any given game. But the way I see the lineup right now is the first line uh, offensively for me would be Cutter Gauthier, Logan Cooley, and Chaz Lucius. Gauthier is going to give you a lot transitionally. He's going to drive the puck up the ice and create off his stick, uh, drive the net. He's got that power forward element, which I really like. That's going to complement Logan Cooley's game very well. Both can drive... Um, transitions extremely well. Both can create off the rush. 
Um, and, and that will sort of benefit Chaz Lucius, who doesn't have that much of a rushing element, but is very good once he gets in the offensive zone. So you let Cutter Gochi just skate it up. Logan Cooley has support if he needs help. Um, then Gochi and Lucia, Lucius find uh, space off the puck, and Logan Cooley just works his magic. He's a stick handling wizard. He's one of the most exciting players from that from the 2022 draft, and he's going to connect with them on a regular basis. And then the second line for me would be Jimmy Snuggerud, uh, Rodger McGordy, and Tyler Boucher. Now, you talk about a physical line, that's a physical line. Snuggerud can throw his weight around, McGordy can throw his weight around, and Tyler Boucher, he's violent if there's a word for him. So those two together would work really well. There's a lot of goal-scoring prowess on that line. I'm not sure where the playmaking element is going to come from. I think Snuggerud's got some decent playmaking, but McGordy and Boucher are mainly scorers. So it's going to be interesting to see them work together. But I think if you're looking for a physical line that's going to, you know, throw sweet around, work the forecheck, uh, you know, make just, make life just difficult for the opposing team, I think that's the line. Then the third line for Team USA for me would be Dylan Duke, uh, Will Smith and Ryan Leonard. Smith and Leonard play on the line right now on Team USA. I don't think they're going to separate them. You add Dylan Duke on top of that line, who's extremely good at finding space and shooting. Um, Will Smith is probably going to be getting a lot of assists from that line. He's going to be the main playmaker, um, the pivot that's going to drive the offense. So I think that line would work well together. And then the last, the final line would be a mainly defensive line in Jackson Blake, Red Savage, and Cam Lund. Savage is uh, a returnee. He was there last year, and he was there in a support role as the defensive center. I think that's going to continue this year. And that's why I think he edges out Stramos because of the experience and the defensive value. Um, so that that final line is going to give you a lot of good minutes and um, you know prevent the, the opposing team from scoring. You can even match them to the first line. They'd probably do a good job. So that's going to be it for today's episode. Thank you very much for watching uh, if you're watching on YouTube. And thank you for listening if you're listening on your favorite podcasting platform. Again, if you like what you saw, make sure to like and subscribe uh, if you're watching on YouTube and to follow along and make us your first listen of the day if, if you're listening on your favorite podcasting platform. For your second listen of the day, make sure to check out Locked On Sports Today. They've got all your updates and news. Uh, check them out right now. They're, they're going to have the, the best updates for what's happened in the last night. Um, they're a great source for all of your information regarding all of your favorite sports. Now, this has been Locked On NHL Prospects with Hattie Kalakesh, and I will see you next time.